Why aren't you all home like the rest of the class? <laughs> My subject today is Pericles as general. I don't expect that it will take up all our time, so uh, if you like, when I'm through, I'd be glad to uh, respond to any questions or comments that you want to make about the Peloponnesian War. Uh, so if, you're, if you think of any as I'm talking, uh, I hope you'll have a shot at it. Near the end of his biography of uh, Pericles, Plutarch describes this great Athenian leader on his deathbed. The best men of Athens and his personal friends are gathered in his room and are discussing the greatness of his virtues and the power he held. Thinking he was asleep, they added up his achievements and the number of his trophies. For his general, he had set up nine commemorating a victory on behalf of the city. Now, we are inclined to think of Pericles primarily as a great political leader, a brilliant orator, a patron of the arts and sciences, the man who, whose work in the peaceful arts shaped what is often called the golden age of Athens. But so it's useful for us to remember that the office to which the people elected him almost every year for some 30 years from which he carried on all of these activities was that of strategos, general. And that foremost responsibility of Athenian generals was to lead armies and navies into battle. From his own time until modern times, Pericles' talents as a general have been criticized and defended. In the first year of the Peloponnesian War, when his strategy called for the Athenians to huddle behind the walls of their city while the invading Peloponnesian army ravaged their lands in Attica, Thucydides says, the city was angry with Pericles. They abused him because as their general, he did not lead them out into battle and they held him responsible for all they were suffering. In the next year, after another invasion and destruction of their crops and farms, and after a terrible plague had struck the city, again Thucydides says, they blamed Pericles for persuading them to go to war, and they held him responsible for their misfortunes. At a lower level, the poet Her uh, Hermippus, one of the uh, poets, uh, comic poets whose work we don't have, but occasionally we have a quotation, and here's one. Her Hermippus presented one of his comedies in the spring of 430, the second year of the war, that simply charged Pericles with cowardice. He addresses Pericles as follows. King of the satyrs, why don't you ever lift a spear, but instead only use dreadful words to wage the war, assuming the character of the cowardly Tellies. But if a little knife is sharpened on a whetstone, you roar as though bitten by the fierce Cleon. Cleon, as you know, was uh, his major opponent in the last years of his life, and Cleon was hawkish and an advocate of aggressive, active fighting. Now, the title of this talk, Pericles is General, is also the name of the most vehement modern attack on Pericles as a general. I say modern, of course, I'm talking about the 19th century. When you're an ancient historian, things take on those proportions. The author, Dr. Julius von Fluch Hartung, was a veteran of the Franco-Prussian War and an appreciative student of what he took to be the lessons taught by the great military historian and theorist, theorist Clausewitz. He believed that he had acquired some useful knowledge of the science of war, as he put it, that led him vigorously and entirely to condemn Pericles' general, generalship. In Pericles' conduct of the Peloponnesian War, he says, we see expeditions without inner unity, without the possibility of greater results. 
and I'm quoting Fluke Hartung now. To avoid danger, Pericles regularly gave away important advantages. Overall, we find the effort to lose no battle, but nowhere to win one. As much as Pericles' personal courage operated in battle and in the assembly, so little did he have of the courage proper to a general, which boldly risks the life of thousands at the decisive moment. As such, he belongs to those, one may say, a philosophical group, which brings everything as neatly as possible into the system and plan, instead of acting openly and vigorously. It is a fact that Pericles, the chief advocate of the anti-Spartan policy, never offered a single battle against the Spartans. At the higher level of strategy, the critique of Pericles is no less severe. Pericles was a good minister of war who made far-sighted preparations, but as general, he did not know how to make good use of the existing situation. Again, I quote, he was a great Burgemeister. This means mayor. It was not a very friendly thing to call the great general who led Athens. He was a great Burgemeister in the true sense of the word. There is the rich many-sidedness of his nature, which was then uh, by that which came into play. His superiority to corruption, everything petty and paltry, yet he lacked the prophet's vision and the certain luck of the born statesman. Above all, he lacked the recklessness which is often needed to lead what has, be what has begun uh, to the goal. As a leader of foreign policy, he was not comparable to a Themistocles. As a general, not even approximately to a Chemon. So, that's the harshest of the critics of Pericles over the years. But Pericles has been very lucky over the years in his defenders. In antiquity, his performance was justified and praised by Thucydides, who was after all a contemporary, a general himself, and the historian of the period whose interpretations have dominated opinion ever since he wrote. For all the objectivity of Thucydides' style, he tells the story very much from Pericles' viewpoint. For instance, when he describes the revolt against the Athenian leader in the second year of the war, and the Athenians' unsuccessful effort to make peace. This is how he describes the aftermath. Being totally at a loss as, what, as to what to do, they, the Athenian people, attacked Pericles. And when he saw that they were exasperated and doing everything as he had anticipated, he called an assembly, since he was still general. He wanted to put confidence into them and leading them away from their anger to restore their calm and their courage. He reports three of Pericles, that is to say Thucydides does, reports three of Pericles' speeches at length without reporting any of the speeches made by his opponents on those occasions, with the result that the reader is made to see the situation through Pericles' eyes. And finally, he makes his own judgment perfectly clear coming down firmly and powerfully on the side of Pericles and against all of his critics. Here's what Thucydides says. As long as he led the state in peacetime, he kept to a moderate policy and kept it safe. And it was under his leadership that Athens reached her greatest heights. And when the war came, and uh, it appears that he also judged its power correctly. Pericles lived for two years and six months after the war began. And after his death, his foresight about the war was acknowledged still more. For he had said that if the Athenians stayed on the defensive, maintained their navy, and did not try to expand their empire in wartime, thereby endangering the state, they would win out. But they acted opposite to his advice in every way. And when their efforts failed, 
They harmed the state's conduct of the war. <clears throat> now, in spite of his, <clears throat> excuse me, of his successor's departure from his strategy and the disasters that resulted in spite of the entry of the Persian Empire into the enemy ranks, the Athenians held out for 10 years after the disastrous Sicilian expedition and for 27 years with interruption altogether. Here's <clears throat> uh, Thucydides' final word on this subject. So more than abundant was Pericles' reasons for his own predictions that Athens would have won in a war against the Peloponnesians alone. Thucydides makes it absolutely clear. Thucydides, uh, Pericles was right in the strategy that he had adopted, and if the Athenians had stuck to it, they would have won the war. <clears throat> Plutarch accepted Thucydides' judgment and added further defense against the charges of cowardice and lack of enterprise that his enemies were launching against Pericles. To Plutarch, the actions that provoked such uh, accusations instead revealed prudence, moderation, and a desire to protect the safety of Athenian soldiers. In 454, we're back now uh, in the first Peloponnesian War, Pericles led a seaborne expedition into the Corinthian Gulf. Thucydides merely reports that he defeated the Sicyonians in battle and ravaged the territory and besieged the important city of Eniadi, though he failed to take it and then sailed home. Obviously answering later criticism, Plutarch concludes his account of these events by saying that Pericles returned to Athens, and now I quote him, having showed himself to be formidable to the enemy, but a safe and effective commander to his fellow citizens, for no misfortune struck the men on the expedition. In 437, he sailed into the Black Sea on a mission of imperial consolidation that amounted to little more than showing the flag to the local barbarians, an action that was too insignificant to be even noticed by Thucydides. But Plutarch does not miss the chance to meet the criticism that had been directed against his hero. On this campaign, according to Plutarch, Pericles displayed the magnitude of his forces and the fearlessness and confident courage with which they sailed wherever they liked and placed the entire sea under their power. In 446, when Boeotia was in rebellion, the bold and ambitious general Ptolemides convinced the assembly to send him at the head of an army to put down the uprising. Plutarch reports that Pericles tried to restrain and to persuade him to, uh, in the assembly making his famous remark that if he would not listen to Pericles, he would not go wrong in waiting for time, the wisest counselor. But Ptolemy's didn't listen and he went. <clears throat> and the result was a disaster. The Athenians suffered many casualties. Ptolemy's was killed, Boeotia was lost. Plutarch's comment is that this incident brought great fame and goodwill to Pericles as a man of prudence and patriotism. Later in the same year, rebellion broke out in Euboea, and Megara revolted, opening the road for a Peloponnesian invasion of Attica. <clears throat> Pericles on this occasion had no choice. He led an Athenian army out to meet the invading army, but instead of fighting a battle, he convinced the Spartans to withdraw and then to negotiate a peace. <clears throat> In retrospect, no doubt, his critics accused him of missing a chance for victory in the field. Thucydides reports the Peloponnesian withdrawal without comment or explanation. But Plutarch uses this action to respond in almost poetic language to later charges that accompanied the Peloponnesian invasion in 431, reporting that his enemies, Pericles' enemies, threatened and denounced him and choruses sang mocking songs to his shame and insulted his generalship for its cowardice and for abandoning everything to the enemy. <clears throat> the Peloponnesians, Plutarch tells us, expected the Athenians to fight 
out of anger and pride. But to Pericles, it appeared terrible to fight a battle against 60,000 Peloponnesian and Boeotian hoplites, for that was the number of those who made the first invasion. I'm, I'm still quoting Plutarch. And to stake the city itself on the outcome. He reports Pericles' calming language to the excited, excited Athenians in 431, saying that trees, though cut and lopped, grew quickly. But if men were destroyed, it was not easy to get them back again. Had he turned, I'm sorry, here he turned to the charges of cowardice and lack of enterprise, and he turned them on their heads and did so more fully in a passage that sums up his view of Pericles' generalship, and I'll read it to you. In his generalship, he was especially famous for his caution. He never, will, he never willingly undertook a battle that involved great risk or uncertainty, nor did he envy or emulate those who took great risks with brilliant success and were admired as great generals. He always said to his fellow citizens, that as far as it was in his power, they would live forever and be immortals. <clears throat> of the many modern scholars who have been persuaded by this view, none has argued more forcefully in favor of Pericles' generalship than Hans Delbruck, perhaps the most renowned military historian of his day, and still a respected figure in that field. He, he and Flug Hartung were contemporaries. Uh, they lived in the, well, the, they did their writing on this subject in the last decades of the 19th century. <clears throat> Annoyed by, <clears throat> by the critics, uh, critiques rather, lately leveled at Pericles and especially by Flug Hartung, <clears throat> um, he wrote a thorough defense in 1890 under the title, The Generalship of Pericles Explained Through the Generalship of Frederick the Great. <clears throat> His main effort in that work is to justify Pericles' conduct of the war that began in 431, the subject of the greatest criticism leveled at the Athenian general. Pericles' strategy did not aim at defeating the Spartans in battle, but was meant to convince them <clears throat> that war against Athens was futile. His strategic goals, therefore, were entirely defensive. He told the Athenians that if they would remain quiet, <clears throat> take care of their fleet, refrain from trying to extend their empire in wartime and so putting their city in danger, they would prevail. The Athenians were to reject battle on land, abandon their fields and homes in the country to Spartan devastation, <clears throat> and retreat behind their walls. Meanwhile, their navy would launch a series of commando raids on the coast of the Peloponnesus. This strategy would continue until the frustrated enemy was prepared to make peace. The naval raids and landings were not meant to do serious harm, but merely to annoy the enemy and to suggest how much damage the Athenians could do if they chose. The strategy was not to exhaust the Peloponnesians physically or materially, but psychologically. <clears throat> no such strategy had ever been attempted in Greek history. For no state before the coming of the Athenian imperial democracy ever had the, man, uh, the means for trying such a strategy. <clears throat> to do so was not easy, for this unprecedented strategy was, uh, ran directly across the grain as you know, of Greek tradition. Willingness to fight, bravery, and steadfastness in battle became the essential characteristics of the free man and the citizen. Pericles' strategy of passivity, therefore, ran counter to the teachings of the Greek tradition. <clears throat> but most Athenians were farmers whose lands and homes were outside the walls. The Periclean strategy required them to look on idly while their houses, crops, and, uh, vines, and olive trees were damaged or entirely destroyed. <clears throat> In the face of these facts, as well as of the power of tradition 
and the cultural values of the Greeks. It is hard to understand, even in retrospect, how Pericles could convince the Athenians to adopt his strategy. <clears throat> Delbruck, keenly aware of Athens' numerical inferiority on land, was convinced of the soundness of Pericles' approach. Here's what Delbruck wrote. <clears throat> The structure of the Peloponnesian War obliges us to give him a position, not simply among the great statesmen, but also among the great military leaders of world history. It is not his war plan as such that bestows this right on him, for the fame of the commander is gained not by word, but by deed, but rather the gigantic power <clears throat> of decision that accompanied it not to halt with a half measure, but to plunge in wholeheartedly and to give up completely what had to be sacrificed, the entire Attic countryside. And in addition, <clears throat> the strength of personal authority that was able to make such a decision understandable to a democratic national assembly and to gain their approval. The execution of this decision is a strategic deed that can be compared favorably with any victory. <clears throat> Take that, critics. Delbrook was pulling no punches, and if you said he was a bum, I say he was the greatest. Delbrook tries to bolster his case by comparing Pericles with Frederick the Great, <clears throat> King of Prussia in the 18th century. During the Seven Years' War, <clears throat> Frederick applied what Delbrook calls a strategy of exhaustion, instead of the strategy of annihilation, in which one army <clears throat> seeks out the other to bring it to decisive battle with the goal of destroying uh, its nation's ability to resist. Such a strategy <clears throat> is sometimes adopted by or forced upon the weaker side in a conflict <clears throat> because no other choice promises success. In the 20th century, the North Vietnamese communists used it with success against the United States. <clears throat> Superior firepower brought the Americans victory in set battles, but was not so effective in dealing with various forms of guerrilla warfare. <clears throat> the communists, therefore, usually avoided battles uh, throughout the war. Continuing warfare over years without a decisive result fed division and discontent in America, and ultimately exhausted the American will to fight. <clears throat> in the Second Punic War, Rome repeatedly suffered crushing defeats in battle at the hands of Hannibal. The Romans therefore chose the tactics of Quintus Fabius Maximus, avoiding battle, <clears throat> harassing the enemy with guerrilla warfare, until they grew stronger, and, uh, and he, far from home and cut off from it by sea, grew weaker <clears throat> and was compelled to withdraw. Pericles' strategy, however, was unlike these strategies in many ways. Unlike the Vietnamese communists and the Romans, he never attempted a set battle on land. The Vietnamese wore down America's resolve by inflicting casualties on their forces. The Romans avoided battle only so, so long as they had to. Their ultimate aim was to defeat the enemy in standard battles, which finally they did in Italy, Spain, and Africa. <clears throat> Delbruck's comparison with Frederick's strategy seems to me no less faulty. The Prussian monarch was driven to it by combat losses in set battles fought over two years, and by the absence of any alternative. He needed to avoid battle to survive. Only good fortune, not calculated war plans, could save him. Britain came to his aid with financial assistance. <clears throat> and then the most incalculable of all things happened, the death of the, Ro of the, Rome uh, sorry, the Russian empress, who was uh, a great fan of the, I mean, who was a uh, hostile to Frederick, broke up the coalition of his enemies, allowing him to escape from the war unbeaten. She was succeeded by uh, a, a Tsar who loved Frederick the Great and thereby saved his neck. <clears throat> the situation confronting Pericles was entirely different from these cases. 
No helpful allies stood in the wings, and no fortunate accident came to divide his opponents. Since he avoided all fighting on land against the Spartans, he inflicted no casualties, as the Vietnamese and the Romans did. They and Frederick, moreover, aimed finally at fighting and winning battles when the odds were in their favor. The core of Pericles' plan, however, was to avoid all land battles, to show that the Peloponnesians could do Athens no serious harm, and to exhaust them psychologically, to make them see reason and understand that their efforts were futile and could not bring them victory. His plan did not work. The element of chance, the unexpected and incalculable, intervened against Pericles and against Athens in the form of the terrible plague that ultimately killed a third of the Athenian population. Of course, all this encouraged the Peloponnesians who refused to be discouraged and continued to fight. When Pericles died in 429, the Athenian treasury was running dry. His plan lay in ruins, and there was no prospect for victory. Only when his successors turned to a more aggressive strategy did the Athenians level the playing field and achieve a position, allow them to hold out for 27 years, and indeed, on more than one occasion, almost brought victory. So it's not surprising that Pericles' strategy in the, Pericle in the Peloponnesian War has brought criticism that raises questions about his capacity as a military leader, even from sober and friendly scholars. <coughs> Georg Buzold, a very distinguished uh, German historian, regarded his strategy as fundamentally right, but even he thought that it was somewhat one-sided and doctrinaire. And in its execution, it was lacking in energetic procedure and in the spirit of enterprise. That's from a very good friend. <clears throat> Hermann Bengtsson, as you can see, the Germans have dominated this entire field of discussion, <clears throat> defends the plan against its critics, but concedes that the carrying out of the offensive part of the plan appears to modern viewers as not very energetic and resolute, I'll say. Their influence, no doubt, these critics are, by the knowledge that Pericles' successors took some actions that did not risk significant land battles or numerous casualties, and yet produced important successes. In the spring of 425, the brilliant and daring general Demosthenes conceived and executed a plan to seize and fortify the promontory of Pylos at the southwestern tip of the Peloponnesus. From there, the Athenians could launch raids at will and encourage the escape or rebellion of the Helots, Sparta's enslaved population. His success panicked the Spartans, who allowed several hundred of their troops to be trapped and captured on the island of Sphacteria, just off Pylos. They immediately proposed a peace, which the Athenians then refused. Later in the same spring, the Athen Athenians seized and garrisoned the island of Scythera, just off the southeastern tip of the Peloponnesus. And immediately they began to launch raids against the mainland. Thucydides reports that the Spartans suffered what I think of as pretty much a nervous breakdown. Here's the account Thucydides gives. <clears throat> the Spartans sent garrisons here and there throughout the country, deciding the number of hoplites by what seemed necessary at each place. In other respects, they were very much on guard for fear that there would be a revolution against the established order. And from every direction, a war rose up around them which was swift and defied precaution. In military aff affairs, they now became more timid than ever before. Since they were involved in a naval contest outside their normal conceptions of preparation for war. And in this unaccustomed area, they fought against the Athenians to whom the omission of an enterprise was always a loss in respect to what they had expected to achieve. In other words, whatever victories the Athenians won, however great, 
they were always disappointed because they had expected more than that. At the same time, the misfortunes that had struck them in such numbers, unexpectedly and in such a short time, caused great terror. And they were afraid, the Spartans were, that another calamity might again strike them sometime, like the one on the island Sphacteria. For this reason, they were less daring in going into battle, and they thought that whatever they undertook would turn out badly because they had no self-confidence as a result of having little previous experience with misfortune. Let me just remind you of, of the enormous confidence with which they entered the war, thinking that it would be no problem at all. All they had to do was walk into Attica, and either the Athenians would come out to fight them as they had done the last time and be destroyed immediately, or they would surrender rather than see their lands destroyed. And look where, to what they had been reduced, not by Pericles' strategy of exhaustion, but by the rejection of that strategy and the effort at a more aggressive approach. <clears throat> In the light of results such as these, it is natural to ask why did the enterprises that produced the need, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the enterprises that produced these successes, why did they need to wait until the fifth year of the war? <clears throat> why didn't Pericles use them at once? His failure to do so is the most weighty of the charges brought against him. And Delbruck uses much effort <clears throat> and ingenuity <clears throat> to defend him. He is forced to concede, however, that a more aggressive offensive effort would have been helpful. He believes that the attack Pericles led against Epidaurus in the second year of the war in 430 <clears throat> was meant to take and hold that city. Quote from uh, Delbruck. If any such conquest had succeeded, any success in Acarnania, any campaign of devastation, however intensive, any fortification of a coastal spot in Messenia would disappear in comparison. Taking Epidaurus, he says, would have threatened the neighboring states near the coast. It might bring peace at once, or at least cool the ardor for war among Sparta's allies. So why did Pericles wait? and then do so little? Delbruck's answer is, we do not know. <clears throat> the failure by so learned, clever, and determined a scholar, and by as many other defenders, to explain Pericles' behavior in this way, I think is a powerful sign that they have taken the wrong path. Pericles did not mean to use any serious offensive measures to wear down the enemy's ability to fight. <clears throat> His goal, as I have said before, was psychological and intellectual, to convince the Spartans and their allies that victory was impossible, that the Athenians could easily sustain the only damage the enemy could inflict, the ravishing of Attica, <clears throat> and to show, that the ally, uh, to show to the allies I'm sorry, that the allies that the Athenians, uh, forgive me, to show to them and the allies that the Athenians could do them considerable harm if they chose. Athens' carefully calculated, limited offensive efforts were meant to deliver a message without inciting the enemy to fight and to fight harder. Just as the carefully calculated, limited attacks by American forces against uh, North Vietnam, aimed at putting pressure on the enemy without causing their Chinese supporters to intervene. That kind of strategy calls for very delicate action and very delicate judgment, and of course there's no guarantee that it will work. <clears throat> the offensive part <clears throat> of Pericles' plan was deliberately to do little harm for actions that were too aggressive <clears throat> might anger the enemy and, uh, and harden his determination. The goal was to depress the enemy's spirit by showing that there was no way for them to win, <clears throat> to destroy their will to fight. Just a, a little footnote here, that's always a, a critical issue in <clears throat> any strategy that anybody adopts in a war. There really are two fundamental goals and uh, they are not always, uh, they do not always produce the same strategy. One is to make it impossible for the enemy to fight. 
to destroy his capacity to fight. If you do that, you have certain victory. The other is to destroy his will to fight. And of course, if you do that, you win. But his will may not be responsive to your approach. <clears throat> if they could destroy the Spartan will, they could be expected to make a negotiated peace that would return to the status quo before the war, only made more secure by the demonstration that it could not be overthrown by force. <clears throat> and that was Pericles' aim in the war. That strategy failed as had Pericles' diplomatic maneuvers in the period leading to war from 433 to 431. When civil war in Epidamnus, a remote town on the fringes of the Greek world, threatened to bring a great war between the Peloponnesian League and the Athenian Empire, Pericles, Pericles as I have argued to you, pursued a policy of restrained, limited intervention meant to deter Corinth Sparta's important ally, without driving the Spartans and all their Peloponnesian allies into a war against Athens. That effort also failed and resulted in a terrible war that Pericles had wanted to, avo uh, to avoid. Do these great strategic failures fully make the case for Pericles' critics? <clears throat> Were they the result of cowardice, lack of enterprise, and resolution? I think that a fair examination of his performance throughout his life as general <clears throat> suggests otherwise. The charge of personal cowardice is ludicrous. Even Flughartung concedes that his personal courage operated in battle and in the assembly. No Athenian who led armies and navies in many battles, repeatedly setting up trophies of victory, could have escaped condemnation <clears throat> had he shown any sign of cowardice nor could he have been re-elected general year after year, <clears throat> if that was the picture of him. Nor did he fail to demonstrate boldness and enterprise. <clears throat> in 446, the very survival of Athens and her empire were threatened. The most menacing rebellions broke out close to home, Euboea, Megara, Boeotia. <clears throat> Pericles swiftly took an army to put down the Euboean rebellion and just as swiftly withdrew on news of the second, which opened the door to a Peloponnesian invasion of Attica. He arrived, you remember, to, uh, just in time to persuade the Spartans to withdraw, and then he returned at once to Euboea to suppress the rebellions there. And again, when the island of Samos launched a dangerous rebellion back in 440, Pericles took personal charge acting promptly and decisively and catching the Samian rebels unprepared for his swift reaction, <clears throat> taking them by surprise, ultimately forcing them to surrender <clears throat> by means of a naval blockade. <clears throat> These expeditions, <clears throat> however, show that Pericles' frequent caution did not derive <clears throat> chiefly from a temperamental tendency <clears throat> or a character flaw, but from thought and calculation. <clears throat> the main reason he avoided land battles <clears throat> against their Spartan, uh, the, uh, Spartan and Peloponnesian allies <clears throat> is because he was certain to lose. <clears throat> the numbers were decisively against him. <clears throat> Yet, he was more careful <clears throat> than were bolder generals. No polis in the Greek world was prodigal with its citizens in battle. And it behooved a general, especially in a democratic state, to keep the casualty lists as low as possible. We need to remember that Athenian generals were not only military leaders, but also politicians who needed to be reelected to their posts every year. No doubt, Pericles sincerely took pride in the prudence and economy of his leadership, but it could not have hurt his political popularity when he boasted to the Athenians, what I've quoted before, that as far as it was in his power, they would live forever and be immortals. <clears throat> Such considerations help explain his cautious performance. And yet, there is no evidence to suggest that he was one of those rare military geniuses who belong 
in the ranks of Hannibal, Caesar, Alexander the Great, a lesser but still worthy example in our own time, uh, George Patton, <coughs> who understand the limits of rational calculation in war <coughs> and the need boldly to seize opportunity when it offers. Pericles was what, uh, a term that was used uh, uh, in the Second World War, a soldier's general, as the, the PR forces of Omar Bradley attached that title to him. He was no George Patton, <clears throat> or perhaps uh, even a, a Bernard Montgomery, who seeks battle only when the odds are very heavily in his favor. <clears throat> he lacked the flair and the boldness of a Kimon, the daring and ruthlessness that seeks victory at any cost. Another element has been suggested to explain the Periclean strategy. Pericles himself, says one critic, <clears throat> was rather an admiral than a general. The Athenian admiralty it was which framed the strategy at the outset of the war. Not Pericles, the burgomaster, but Pericles, the admiral, invented the strategy of exhaustion, a strategy which came near to ruining Athens in a couple of years and could never have won the victory. <clears throat> well, there is some merit in this analysis. The Athenians under Pericles had built a grand strategy that was based on naval power that might seem to suit a maritime empire whose homeland was an island such as Great Britain's, or a power that dominates a continent and is separated from other great powers by two great oceans, like the United States. Athens' geographical situation was not so fortunate for the city was attached to the mainland, <clears throat> offering targets of coercion not available to the enemies of the great Anglo-Saxon countries. <clears throat> Pericles tried to cancel that disadvantage by building the long walls connecting the city to its fortified harbor, thereby in effect turning the city into an island. It was an extraordinary strategy, far ahead of its time in its reliance on human reason <clears throat> and technology, and its rejection of traditional ways of fighting that cost lives and gave the enemy an advantage. At the same time, he abandoned all ideas of further expansion and devised a policy aimed at preserving peace and the status quo that perfectly suited Athenian interests. Such a policy depended for success on an extraordinary an extraordinary amount of rationality on everyone's part. <clears throat> the Athenians must be content with what they had <clears throat> and abandon hopes for extension of their power. <clears throat> there were always Athenians who objected to that. But while he lived, Pericles had the wisdom and the political strength to restrain and control them. What he could not control were the other states and especially the enemy. <clears throat> Unexpected changes and shifts in power are the normal condition of international history. These changes have always taken place <clears throat> because international relations are guided only partially <clears throat> and spasmodically by rational calculations of material advantage. <clears throat> always at work as well are greed, Ambition, jealousy, resentment, anger, hatred, and Thucydides' famous triad, fear, <clears throat> honor, and interest. In the world as it has been, therefore, <clears throat> a state satisfied with its situation <clears throat> and wishing to preserve peace cannot rely on a reasoned response to its reasoned policies but must anticipate challenges that seem unreasonable. <clears throat> the Spartans and their allies ought to have recognized that they had no realistic strategy to promise victory over Pericles' reliance on defense and refusal to fight a major land battle. <clears throat> but resentment and anger at Athenian power and the fear that it might ultimately undermine their own alliance and their security led them to fight. 
as I find it usual in human history, they were more influenced <clears throat> by the memory of the Athenians' failure to fight a traditional battle and negotiating a peace in 446 <clears throat> than by the recognition that the new technology <clears throat> in the form of the long walls made it unnecessary for Athens to risk such a battle in the future. To deter a war in such circumstances, which is what Pericles was trying to do, <clears throat> requires some offensive threat to the Peloponnesians whose menace was great and impossible to underestimate. That would make the fear of immediate consequences of war stronger than all the emotions leading to war. But Pericles had come to think of Athens as an invulnerable island <clears throat> uh, since the uh, acquisition of a fleet, a vast treasury to support it, and defensible walls. For such a state to adopt a defensive strategy is natural. It had developed a unique and enviable way of fighting that used these advantages and avoided much of the danger and unpleasantness of ordinary warfare. It allowed the Athenians to concentrate their forces quickly and attack uh, islands and coastal enemies before they were prepared. It had permitted them to strike others without danger to their own city and population. Success in this style of warfare made it seem the only one necessary. <clears throat> and defeats with great losses on land made the Athenians reluctant to take risks by fighting on land. Offensive action, in their view, should be taken as a last resort only, only when it was absolutely unavoidable. Pericles carried this approach to its logical conclusion by refusing to use a land army even in defense of the homeland, much less by using it uh, in offensive efforts that might do the enemy serious harm. The enemy's passionate refusal to see reason made what might be called the Athenian way of warfare inadequate and Pericles' strategy a form of wishful thinking that failed. For a state like Athens in 431, <clears throat> satisfied with the situation, capable of keeping the enemy at bay, the temptation to avoid the risks of offensive action is great. But as people often don't notice, it contains great dangers. It tends to create a rigid way of thinking that leads men to apply a previously successful strategy or one supported by a general theory to a situation in which it is not appropriate. But it may have other disadvantages as well. <clears throat> its capacity to deter potential enemies from provoking a war is severely limited. Deterrence by standing behind a strong defensive position and thereby depriving the enemy of the chance of victory assu assumes a very high degree of rationality and uh, some degree of imagination on the part of the enemy. <clears throat> Spartans invaded Attica in 431. They must have thought they were risking little. Even if the Athenians refused to fight, even if they persisted in that refusal for a long time, both of which they thought was unlikely and unnatural, the Spartans would still be risking little more than time and effort. In any case, <clears throat> their lands and city would be safe. Had the Athenians possessed the capacity <clears throat> to strike where the enemy was vulnerable, and had that capacity been obvious to everybody, <clears throat> Pericles' strategy of deterrence might have been effective. Once the war came, there was no way to win without abandoning the Athenian way of war <clears throat> and the Periclean strategy. As Pericles lay dying in the fall of 429, his strategy was a failure. After three campaigning seasons, the Peloponnesians showed no signs of exhaustion of any kind. On the contrary, <clears throat> they had just lately refused an Athenian offer of peace and fought on with the determination to destroy Athenian power forever. The Athenians, on the other hand, had seen their lands and homes ravaged repeatedly, their crops and trees burnt and destroyed. <clears throat> they were also suffering from the plague, which was killing great numbers of them, 
and destroying their moral fiber. In the anecdote that I, be, I quoted at the beginning of this uh, talk, Plutarch speaks of Pericles' response to the praise of his military prowess, you'll remember. <clears throat> he expressed astonishment. You know, they thought he was sleeping, it turned out he wasn't, he was hearing what they were saying. He expressed astonishment that they should be praising what was the result of good fortune as much as his own talents and what many others had accomplished. Instead, he said, <clears throat> they should be praising the finest and the most important of his claims to greatness. That no Athenian now alive has put on mourning clothes because of me. That assertion, the last words of Pericles reported to us, must have astounded his audience. <clears throat> Even his friends would have had to admit that his policy had contributed at least something to the coming of the war and that his strategy had something to do with the intensity <clears throat> of the destruction caused by the plague. His final words show deeply uh, how he felt the wounds caused by the widespread accusations hurled against him and his stubborn refusal to admit that he had been wrong in any way. <clears throat> he had applied his great intelligence to his city's needs and reason told him that he was not responsible for the results, which he must have believed to be temporary. He must have thought <clears throat> in time his expectations would be fulfilled. If his fellow citizens would have the wisdom and courage to hold to his strategy, they would win out. So he believed and so did his contemporary Thucydides. More than two millennia later, <clears throat> Clausewitz saw war through very different eyes. <clears throat> I quote him. War is more than a true chameleon that slightly shapes its characteristics to the given case. As a total phenomenon, <clears throat> its dominant tendencies always make war a paradoxical trinity composed of primordial violence, <clears throat> hatred, and enmity which are to be regarded as a blind natural force. Of the play of chance and probability within which the creative spirit is free to roam. And its elements of subordination as an instrument of policy which makes it subject to reason alone. These three tendencies are like three different codes of law, deep rooted in their subject and yet variable in their relationship to one another. A theory that ignores any one of them or seeks to fix an arbitrary relationship between them would conflict with reality to such an extent that for this reason alone, it would be totally useless. Like most generals in history, and unlike its few military geniuses, <clears throat> Pericles saw war as essentially a linear phenomenon, <clears throat> subject, as Clausewitz said, to reason alone. And too little, in my judgment, did he understand its other aspects. For that, he and his people paid a very great price. Okay, well, we do have some time, and I'd be very glad to uh, hear any questions or comments that any of you would like to make. And, after all, we only have a 27-year war, and we've got 20 minutes to talk about it. No problem. Anybody have anything to say? Yes, sir. That's a fairly long story, <clears throat> but I think the best answer I can give is the one I gave yesterday, uh, last time when I spoke about Thucydides' reasons for writing the story that he did. He had been a supporter of Pericles <clears throat> and uh, things hadn't worked out well. Uh, the state had gone in a direction very different from the one that he favored, including a strategy that was the opposite of Pericles. The average guy in the street, who was a guy that he didn't approve of very much, thought wrongly, he, th he believed, 
that Pericles had been right, uh, had been dead wrong. It was Pericles' fault they went to war. It was Pericles' fault they lost the war. And Thucydides associated himself, I think, with Pericles and his approach to things. And so he had to make the case. He believed the case that he made. I mean, it's very important to realize that. Uh, and Plutarch, coming many centuries later, like everybody who has ever spoken about the Peloponnesian War once Thucydides had written, was powerfully influenced by Thucydides. I think just about everybody who's ever considered the war has come away pretty much with Thucydides' judgment of these things. So I think that's the answer to that. Oh, yes. Did somebody have a hand up? No. I imagine the hand. Yes. Uh, the question is, can I think of any modern <coughs> generals who did use uh, Pericles' approach as um, <coughs> a model? I think the answer is not anybody, well, yeah, General McClellan <laughs> in the Civil War. And it was a very an analogous situation. McClellan did not want to fight Lee's army. <coughs> he wasn't all that crazy about the anti-slavery stuff anyway, but apart from that, <coughs> He didn't want to pay the price, <clears throat> which was a tremendous price of fighting the Civil War. And so he wanted to avoid battle. And uh, pretty much Lincoln couldn't get him to fight. So uh, that was this, that's one example. Now, this, the, next, the next thing I would offer you as a, something to chew on, at least, because it, it's not identical, it's only similar. <clears throat> I think the, the strategy undertaken by the uh, Secretary of Defense in the current administration in launching the attacks on Afghanistan and on Persia, uh, Persia, Iraq. <laughs> I got Greeks, I got Greeks on my mind, I have to fight Persians. <laughs> uh, Iraq reflected an aspect of it. They would both, for reasons I don't have to explain to you, desperately eager to reduce casualties to a minimum. And they were desperately eager to uh, choose a, a, an, a, a, an approach that would limit the time that the war lasted because of the political situation in the last decades in American history. And they had an advantage technologically uh, that seemed to make that possible. America's fantastic advantage in firepower, the capacity to deliver the, the firepower uh, at a distance with very little risk to the deliverers, with the notion of doing tremendous harm when it got there. Uh, but you rem I don't know if any of you remember any of this. Some of you were too young to even think about it, I guess. But <clears throat> Originally, remember, what was that phrase that they had? What was, what was that great strategy we were going to use by bombing the hell out of the Iraq? Shock and awe. It was the same thing. Shock and awe was meant to say, oh my God, this is going to happen to us. We quit, was what they had in mind. And uh, they deliberately chose not to have ground forces that would have been capable of uh, doing the kinds of things that um, it turns out you need to, to do to be successful in these wars, just like other wars. Uh, so the, and, and when it happened that it was clear things were not working out according to their plan, they stubbornly clung to that plan, even as the evidence was that it wasn't going to work. So that would be a candidate, I'd suggest. Yes, sir. Yeah. A little bit louder, please. Yeah, I, the question is, do I, do I think that uh, re recent Athenian history, or, or, the, or the structure, you mean the democratic society, the democracy had anything to do with the adoption of this plan? Perhaps. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. There must have been a very clear and painful memory of 
What happened to Tomides when he invaded Boeotia? There were very, very heavy casualties there for the Athenians. That's the only one in which they did have a lot, but they did have those, and they were unusual. <clears throat> so that, it may have persuaded Pericles that the Athenian people would find it hard, but on balance, I really think not. Uh, I don't think that the Athenian democracy was very different from the oligarchies of the other Greek cities in the way they thought about things. Uh, they would have much preferred to fight it out. It was only Pericles' incredible command of the political situation that allowed him to take this strategy that people said, what, what in the world is this guy doing? And they turned against it very swiftly. So no, I don't think the democracy was especially important. Now, the enemies of Pericles and the enemies of democracy, I, I shouldn't say the enemies of Pericles, I mean the ancient enemies of democracy, do say that it was the Athenian democracy's way of running the war which guaranteed disaster, and they fix on something that comes later down the road, the Sicilian expedition, which was a, uh, a dangerous undertaking as it turned out, although the Athenians didn't think so at the time, <clears throat> And they think only a democracy could have done anything as stupid as that. And they are, in that way, following precisely what Thucydides says. And, uh, but if, if you read my account, you'll see that there's another way of looking at it. But that, that's what the ancient uh, anti-democratic view was. Democracies are idiots. They don't know how to conduct war or do anything else right. They will bring disaster. Uh, I think you can get disaster a lot of ways. Milica. <clears throat> Yeah, no, uh, <clears throat> it's very clear that so long as Pericles was in charge, everybody did what Pericles wanted done. Part of the reason <clears throat> was that we know pretty well uh, from the evidence that at least a good number of the ten generals in any one year were close to Pericles, so that his political influence spread. Very unusual thing in the ancient world for anybody, for, in ancient Athens, for anybody to have that kind of a carryover effect, but uh, we see there's always several generals that we know are friends of Pericles. And I think the rest of the story is that, you see, the generals don't get to decide what they do in ancient Athens. This is the part that blows your mind. When you send an army out, that army gets a general or more. It gets an assigned amount of money and equipment and stuff, and it gets orders. And all of those things are decided by the assembly after a debate by a majority vote. And what I would suggest to you is that Pericles did not lose any of those arguments, except in the one case when they came after him and nailed him, and then they put him back in office again. So does that uh, take care of your question, Melissa? Good. Yeah, Heather. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> the question, the heart of the question is, was uh, Pericles wise to adopt the strategy, no matter how good a strategy it might have been, which he knew the Athenians didn't like? And I think the answer, well, in the, in the, res the outcome is obvious. No, he wasn't wise. But <laughs> that's, I think, more because the strategy was faulty, not so much because the Athenians didn't like it. He had proven over the years, and he proved now in the most delicate of times, that essentially he could get the Athenians to do what he wanted to do, whether in fact they liked it to begin with or not. He persuaded them to do it. So I don't think that was really a flaw. The problem that was that things went wrong almost immediately, <clears throat> and then such terrible things were happening as did shake his power for a while, but even then he came back into power and still the strategy wasn't working. I think the problem therefore, I think you could say he knew what he was doing. He thought he could get away with it, and he could have, if the strategy had been correct. Yes?
Oh, yes. <clears throat> Yes, the, the question is, um, ancient writers, Plutarch is whom you're really talking about, um, they uh, give Pericles credit for being a great general, but they say bad things about Nicias, who uh, was involved in the great defeat in Sicily, uh, and yet um, Nicias pursued something like the strategy of Pericles, which was avoiding these conflicts. Well, I think... <clears throat> First thing to, I want to point out is that Thucydides didn't do that. Not only does Thucydides sub thoroughly support the strategy of Pericles, he writes an encomium on the death of Nicias that raises him to the level of Pericles or higher in his own estimation. Uh, but in the case of Nicias, it was in a way even worse <clears throat> than uh, what Pericles did because Nicias, first of all, was against the war, against going to Sicily in the first place. Then when he was chosen to be general, he went. But before he did that, he tried to convince the, having lost the, the vote, shall we go, he then decided to trick the Athenians into not going anyway by saying to them, oh, well, if you're going to go, all right, but it'll be perfectly safe if you just sort of take this the original uh, fleet was going to have 60 ships, period. Well, it ended up having 130 ships, 5,000 hoplites, uh, raising the risk of that thing to the level that finally made it seem like they could lose the war by losing the Sicilian campaign. <coughs> and he didn't, the Athenians, instead of saying, which what he expected, oh, no, no, if that's what we have to do, let's not go. Instead, they said, Right on! Yes, you can have everything you ask for, Nicholas. What would you like? And off they went. And thereafter, his performance on that uh, expedition is one of somebody who doesn't really want to carry out his instructions. He just, what he would have liked to do is having lost the argument twice now, <clears throat> he went out and did everything he could to avoid confronting any battle in Syracuse and uh, was finally driven to fight at Syracuse, very much against his will. And then I could, you know, go back and read it, but he screws up the detail of it over and over again. Uh, and so I think there are good grounds from, for condemning him uh, as a general, uh, whereas the grounds on which Pericles should be uh, criticized, I think, is as a strategist rather than as a, a commander. Anybody else? Yeah. <clears throat> in your opinion, could the Athenians defeat the Peloponnesians by engaging in major land battles? Or no. But I think they, well, I'll make one little exception to that, but I, I think they could have had a very good chance to come out of the war in the way Pericles hoped they would if they had pursued the limited aggressive program that was undertaken by Cleon and Demosthenes after the death of Pericles. So, taking Pylos, building a fort at Pylos, taking Scythera, building a fort there, and perhaps even a few more other places on the periphery of the Peloponnesus, and launching attacks from those places, but not staying to fight the Spartans at any great battle, just causing that to happen. If they had been able to do that for a stretch of time, then <clears throat> the hope that Cleon had that the Helots might escape to these forts and that then ultimately bring about an internal upheaval which the Spartans panicked might happen would have uh, uh, led the Spartans to offer peace. And in fact, they do. The Spartans offer peace. Many, many, you could argue that if the Athenians had simply accepted the Spartan peace offer in 425, the war would have been over and the Athenian Empire would have been intact just the way Pericles wanted it. So not only could they have done it, they would have done it if they had accepted it. They wouldn't accept victory, you could argue, as many a scholar does. The, other, the only other point I want to make is, <clears throat> after that didn't happen, and finally a peace was drawn up and signed, and in effect, in 421, which is another evidence that they could achieve what they wanted by the techniques that were put forward. But after that happened, that peace broke down, and now the Athenians found themselves part 
of a new alliance of states, Peloponnesian, uh, Athenians with three Peloponnesian democracies, who produce a big land battle in the Peloponnesus, and the Athenians come that, I mean the, the enemies of Sparta, come that close to defeating the Spartan army in the Peloponnesus. Had they done that, they would have finished Sparta off as a dominant power in Greece. So the answer is, they, they actually had it in their hands a couple of times, and on another time they missed by about an inch. Yeah, they could have won that way. I think we're out of time. Let me wish you all a very happy holiday. Bye-bye.